Hey everyone, my name is John Carbello. I'm the president of Stone Oak Capital and Divestopedia. We're going to have a great discussion here, and this discussion is going to be targeted to all the trusted advisors uh, that are part of our community. We're going to be talking about how we can engage clients earlier uh, to create more successful transitions, more successful ex exits, more successful M&A um, processes. So as always, I have some wonderful guests joining me to share their expertise on uh, really how we can engage prospective clients earlier in the exit transition uh, succession process. So joining me today, uh, he's not here yet, but will be, uh, Joe Straziri, co-founder and principal at the Founders Group, uh, Sean uh, Hutchinson, CEO at Strategic Value Advisors, and Scott Snyder, who's our president, who's the president of the Exit Planning Institute. Welcome, guys. Thanks very much, John. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So our sponsor for today is the Exit Planning Institute, which we're super humbled and grateful for. Uh, and again, all the panelists are actually certified exit planning advisors. So Scott, maybe before we start, could you just sure. provide us with a little bit of background on the Exit Planning Institute uh, and the SEPA yeah. designation? Yeah, sure. So the Exit Planning Institute is an educational company that supports the work of professional advisors. So we help you connect better with business owners in the small to lower middle market that those owners are looking to grow value and position to sell while aligning their business, personal and financial goals. So for you as the professional advisor, uh, we provide the credential, which is SEPA, which John mentioned, but also the courses, the content, uh, the conferences, the community, all of these things that help kind of power that relationship with the, with the business owner, regardless if you're a wealth manager, consultant, CPA, M&A person, I think one of the beauties of EPI is everybody kind of comes together around that kind of vision of helping take businesses from very successful year over year businesses to very significant ones that have high valuation and that are ready and attractive and and uh, and, and transferable. So um, in a nutshell, that that's EPI. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned that uh, how many members are in EPI now is an amazing number. Yeah, John, you and I go way back. I remember, I think I met you like at AM and AA like years ago. But yeah, yeah EPI yeah, is, is certainly has has evolved. So we have nearly 5,000 certified exit planning advisors right now. But what people don't really realize is there's another 15,000 advisors that I always say kind of hang out inside of the EPI community. So they're interacting with our content, coming to our webinars and think tanks, or coming to the conference, and, and probably more so than not. Uh, interacting in our chapter network. So we have 30 chapters across the United States that provide both in-person and virtual options. So if there's not one in your backyard yet, uh, feel free to go on to epichapters.com and check out the community there and, and feel free to interact. Yeah, that's awesome. Great, uh, great story, uh, great community and, and just, uh, you know, you in particular, great uh, growth that you've kind of uh, implemented in that uh, in your organization there, Scott. So congrats Thanks. on that. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping, uh, and we're going to have the Q&A box for any sort of questions at the end uh, of the session, and uh, also have the chat box open. So if you'd like to make comments throughout the presentation or let us know where you're at, uh, please do that. Uh, do that. I think it'd be uh, exciting and, and fun for, uh, for the hosts there and for myself and, and also the panelists. Um, one thing I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to put everybody's uh, LinkedIn uh, profile just in the chat box so you can see uh, our panelists get a sense of, of who they are uh, and then also you can also uh, have a link to the EPI and just how to earn the uh, the SEPA designation mm -hmm. so let's get into it we got a lot to do um, and Joe is saying that he's on as an attendee so Joe if you're an attendee uh, I just emailed you the the link specific link that you have uh, and you can get into uh, become a panelist and hope you can join us here soon so um so let, let's just talk about understanding the benefits of, of early engagement here. Uh, Sean, like you, you talk about um, in some of your concepts that you, you try to um, educate us on, you talk about this idea of like three types of owners. Can, can you maybe run us through that idea of the different owners and then meeting them where they're at? Yeah, sure. So uh, we're value growth advisors. So we interact with a lot of different kinds of owners at different stages of their journey toward some type of ownership transition. And that can be internal to employees or management teams. It can be outside to third parties or private equity groups. We support them all. And uh, some, I guess it was probably oh, several years ago, it's pre COVID, as we all re refer to it, pre COVID. Um, we were in a strategic planning meeting and, and 
someone was asking what our ideal client is. And we started to describe the client as the business. It's a business with this much revenue, this much profit in these industries, not those industries, healthy, not distressed, so on and so forth. And then we just kind of stopped dead in our tracks. And we thought, wait a minute, our client is actually the owner. It's not the business. The business is a vehicle. The owner is our client. So, so we backed up and we identified kind of three categories of owners that we thought were helpful to think about and helped us organize our marketplace. So I'll run through them really quickly. One, the explorers. So explorers are folks that are seeking insights and information, but they're not ready to engage in any kind of advisory process or program yet. So their desire, their primary desire is clarity. And I think there are lots of things that we can do as an advisory community to help them get there. Second category, pivoters. Pivoters are what a value growth advisor would refer to as a value acceleration client. We call them pivoters because they go from a relatively low state of action and planning to a much higher state. Uh, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but they're also folks with time. So they might be working five years in advance of any kind of planned ownership transition. They may still not even know how they're going to do it. So, so they're really working on building the enterprise value of the business, transferability of that enterprise value. Third category are what we call triggerers. Triggerers have a shorter event horizon. Let's call it an event horizon for the ownership transition. So they might be in the 12 to 24 month range, right? And that the, a 20, 24 months, quite frankly, is pretty fast. So, so when that event horizon has moved forward, instead of doing value acceleration work, we're coming together as a community in the SEPA community to provide decision support. So the goal is in those cases to help an owner make the best decisions possible what, under the circumstances, whatever those may be. That event horizon might move forward because of an adverse health diagnosis or a family situation or a business situation. You never really know. But the key here in an early conversation is to talk to the owner. It's useful for us to ask them to put themselves in one of those categories. Where are you? Let us describe those really quickly to you. Where would you put yourself? By that simply locates them on a spectrum so that now you can know sort of the zone of conversation. Instead of trying to convince them to be a triggerer when they're actually an explorer or convince them to pivot when they're just not there, you need to understand exactly what their psychology is. And by asking them to locate themselves, you've really got a better chance, I think, of having a meaningful conversation that will in fact be motivating to them. It also prevents you from going in as a salesperson who's trying to kind of lasso them around the neck and pull them over. You're basically right away communicating, I care more about where you are than where I am, which is just a feature of good early engagement. Yeah. And I, I always, you know, we, as an M&A advisor, I always find clients that come to me and say, Hey, like I want to sell my business. And I try to take uh, a few steps back and say, well, okay, you know, where, where you know, to your point, where, where are you, or what kind of, uh, uh, you know, what type of owner are you and, and where are you in the cycle right now? Uh, Scott, can you maybe highlight how kind of early engagement can really lead to more strategic and streamlined business sales processes, yeah. uh, which I think is effectively what we want to do or, or other types of transitions yeah. as well. No, I think you hit it, the nail on the head too, and you're kind of like in your opening comment there. And I think that an educated client is it just makes a bet for a better client, especially in M and A. If anybody kind of knows our history, my dad was actually was one of the first 100 certified exit planning advisors, and he at the time, though he was a, a growth consultant, he was doing a lot of M and A work with his business partner. And so when he became a SEPA, they brought in this whole front end of what we call now the value acceleration methodology to create better deal flow, but also to create some steady revenue. And not that the M&A advisor needs to do this stuff, but they could also either do it directly themselves or indirectly through, frankly, folks like Sean, who's readying businesses for sale. But for me, in, in terms of kind of streamlining the, the sales process, when you look at the value acceleration methodology, one of the things that we're doing for them is almost putting them through like a pre-due diligence process. So, not, so it, it's creating just a, a totally different mindset for the business owner. So if you're working effectively with a, a value growth advisor, SEPA, uh, you and having an owner come through the value acceleration methodology, you are uh, creating a virtual data room, you're documenting processes, again, kind of going through this pre diligence process, I think creating higher value in your business, and at the, at the same time, a more ready owner. So the owner's in the mindset. I think at the end of the day, uh, really, uh, the value acceleration methodology teaches a business owner to think about their business from a buyer's perspective. 
I think we always say that um, many owners today are kind of shocked, regardless of, of size, when they get to the M&A process, because for the first time, somebody slapped them in the face and said, your baby's ugly. So why not take care of that way earlier on in the process so that when I actually decide, hey, okay, it's time to take my, my business to market, I'm ready, I'm attractive, I have the great mindset to make this deal happen, and my business is uh, kind of ready to roll. Yeah, you know, there, there's so many uh, kind of daunting statistics out there on, you know, when a, a buyer actually, or when a seller actually goes to market, uh, just kind of how many fail transactions are. I think it's like 30% of all businesses that actually go to market uh, kind of end up selling. Uh, I don't right. know if you guys can corroborate those statistics or not, but, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, what, what, what's, um, what, what do you see as some kind of like the potential impact on the success rate um, and, you know, more importantly, client satisfaction of, of doing this earlier, like engaging earlier. Maybe you can, uh, Scott, I'll, I'll put this to you, yeah. but maybe you can talk yeah, about sure. that. Yeah, sure. And Sean, feel free to chime in. I think that goes all the way back, I think, up to the EPI founder. So the EPI founders back in 2005 were two M&A advisors. And the story goes, John, is that they just had sold a, a company for multiple multi-million dollars. And they were doing a 90-day check-in with the, the, the person that they had sold the company with. And when the when the client left, the two owners of EPI, which uh, well, I guess before EPI, the owners of their investment banking group, turned to each other and said, "Man, that guy seemed, you know, relatively unhappy. Like we maximize value, we minimize taxes. Like what the heck's this guy's problem?" <laughs> and what they realized, and and kind of having a conversation, they said, "Well, I guess I've never even met that guy's financial advisor or wealth manager, and I never one time talked to him about what he wants to do next." So although their role as the M and A advisor was to maximize value, minimize taxes. What a shame because that owner did do that, but now is left unhappy and unhappy with, with plenty of money for the next phase or acts of his life. And so I think that really in today's market, uh, it's really about the holistic mindset. In particular, if you look at the next generation of business owners, it's called people in their 40s and early 50s. I think that's what they're kind of naturally look for. They look for this balance and blend. And a lot of them, and as many as you probably know on, on in, in our attendees today, are these boomerang exits, right? They're going to sell multiple companies over the course of their life. Like every decade, I feel somebody in that kind of generation might be doing something different. So they have an opportunity to have multiple exits. So to me, it's not just about the money. It's about really the holistic approach. I'll do yes and on that, John. So, okay. so Scott's right about everything as usual. But with, so here's another statistic. 75% of owners who sell one year later profoundly regret the decision. So that's been consistent over the years. It's a, it came originally from a PricewaterhouseCoopers study and what they, what they're finding, what they found at that time and continue to find is that it's not because of the money. Most owners who exit get, who successfully exit, get pretty much what they want out of the deal or at least enough. And I think the personal financial planning and the life after business planning is a big piece of that because they know their number they have an idea what they're going to do with that money, what's meaningful to them. We always say post-exit, it is not what you are going to do. It's who you are going to be. That's a really important <laughs> distinction because the identity is going to shift really quickly from I'm a business owner, which is a, it's like a location. It's a stake in the ground in their relationships, in their community, so on and so forth. They may not even realize how important it is to them until they don't have it anymore. And now all of a sudden they're kind of adrift. So part of it was... They didn't have a plan for post closing for that post for that reason to set the alarm the morning after they closed, and and they also didn't enjoy the experience that they were going through primarily because it was very spotty. They didn't have the right professionals or not a complete team of professionals at the table, so it felt really disjointed, really unpleasant. Even though the deal got done, so then you have a lot of people out there who are chattering away saying, "Don't go through that. Don't ever do that." Again, that's not the kind that's not the kind of conversation in our world as advisors who have a vested interest in making it happen on behalf of our clients. That's not the kind of conversation headwind that you want to go up against. So we yeah. all have a vested interest in making sure that they're happy coming out of the product. They become advocates. Uh hundred -huh, percent. And we talked about uh, this briefly yesterday, Sean, but uh, knowing the client's objectives might um, you know, influence where we're going with, it might not be an, an outright exit for the, yeah. for the business owner. It might be another form of transaction uh, that might help them meet their objectives or what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. So 
uh, again, this early, um, you know, the, the, the hammer for every nail type type of scenario uh, might not be the right thing to do uh, for a client. You might have to step back and think about, okay, what, what is it that you really want to achieve and, and what kind of, what form of transaction might, uh, might help you get there. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So it looks like we're having some technical difficulties with Joe. So uh, Scott, Scott and Sean, you guys are going to have to carry the ball on this. Okay. Um, I think we got it. <laughs> you do got it for sure. <laughs> uh, so just a quick reminder to our audience, if you ha do have questions, uh, for Scott and Sean, please put them in the Q and A box, and we'll get to them at the end of the uh, at the end of the session here. Last ten minutes or so. Um, so, Sean, going back to you, uh, can can you just share some insights on like recognizing signals that indicate that a business uh, business owner's readiness to sell? Like, I, I, what I really want to do for the audience is really kind of make it practical, so they can kind of integrate some best practices into their. Um, Practices or if they're trusted by. So Sean, if you can, if you can just talk about some of the signals, like recognizing some of these signals. Yeah. So I think, I think, and so there are lots of them. So let me, let me just try to highlight two or three here because these are complex nuanced conversations, right? And you, you become one of the things that we say in these early conversations in the, you have to become a great interviewer. You have to be authentic. You have to be curious. You have to be able to pursue an idea with, with, uh, with real curiosity so that you're not guessing about what the owner is saying. So the conversation is going to lead places where you're, you're probably not comfortable. But here's the number one tell for me. As you go through the conversation, if the owner says something like, huh, no one's ever asked me that before. Now you're right, you're exactly where you need to be. So asking, sort of having a list of things, a checklist that you want to go through that everybody else has the same checklist, I can guarantee you. So you're just kind of, you know, wrote, let's go through down, you know, down through this and figure out what's going on, give me the fact pattern, whatever it may be. It has to go beyond that. So getting them to lean in, physically lean in. The second piece is they start asking you lots of questions. So they're literally leaning in physically, they're leaning in verbally. It becomes more of a conversation rather than just a one-way uh, sort of, you know, it's back and forth and it's, and it's intense. It's nuanced. It's got a lot of color to it. Those are the things that you want to see. You literally want them to react physically in these early engagements because now you know that you've hit kind of a meaningful vein, if you will, will that you can mine with them. It also tends to be a lot more collaborative. So it's not just about, oh, here's a solution. Let's talk about that. I'll educate you about that. They sit back. They're kind of passive. They'll start, well, what about this? What about that? What if I went down this road? What if I went down that road? What's the implication? So you can make a lot of progress in a half hour conversation if that exchange is going on. But you have to go in with a framework, I think. Maybe that three types of owners framework or something like that might work for you to just to know where to start. But then it's really about being, I, I, I don't know any other way to put it, a fascinating conversationalist. Honestly, you just have to really intrigue the person that you're talking to, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do. We're technicians. We love our techniques, right? We love our, to be able to engineer solutions. That's what we've been trained to do. But you got to imagine that you're at a dinner party and you're supposed to be the most interesting part of this conversation in one way or another. And if you can't maintain that, I don't think the engagement is really there. The engagement is not around the technique. It's not around the the sort of, you know, in, the ins and outs of how this actually mechanically might work. It's really about true human engagement. Yeah. What what's uh, you know, have you is there one kind of common question that maybe we can let our audience know that that you've asked that the business owner stops and says, "Well, no one's really asked me that before." Yeah, well, well, one thing that I do like as a conversation starter, if you will, is if you're talking to someone who's been in business for however long, 30, 35, 40 years, let's say, and so a late in life, late stage business owner in most cases, I always ask them to take me back to the moment when they decided to become an entrepreneur. So in that moment, when they decided most likely either maybe they were in a family business and they took over the family business. That's one thing, right? But they have to make, that's a conscious choice to do that and to do it well. But maybe they're an employee of a large corporation 
and they decide to become an entrepreneur. There is an inflection point for them. There is a whole, there's a point at which they said to themselves, I'm going to do this. Maybe it was a family decision, whatever it might look like. They are probably more tired after 40 years in business, sort of managing that stress that comes along, that risk that comes along with being an entrepreneur. You take them back to that moment where they decided to do it. That was very much a fire in the belly, anything is possible, you know, moment for them. So to take them back there and to get them in touch with that literally, I think, turns their brain on. It gets things moving in a very different, in a very different and very positive way. Yeah. One question that does not work, and I would really want to warn people away from, is what keeps you up at night? That's exactly the wrong place to start the conversation because there's a fight or flight reaction in the brain. And the last thing you want is in a new conversation, someone trying to put the gloves on with you or just <laughs> thinking to themselves, I don't want to talk about that. I want to leave the room. Yeah. So that's not engagement, but some people kind of interpret it. If I can make them uncomfortable, you know, cause it'll stir them up and they'll start talking about this. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work well. So try to find a positive point in that. I've gotten a lot of owners to lean in and say, wow, that's it was a long time ago, but sure, I'll talk about that with you and off they go. All I have yeah. to do is sit back and listen. Yeah, no, good, good advice. Um, you know, S Scott, uh, can, can you just like maybe provide the audience with some effective methods that you've seen uh, you or, or some of your other SEPAs have used uh, for identifying and targeting potential clients sure. who may benefit from this early engagement? Yeah, so what I think about uh, two different things, right? So let me maybe start with identifying. So we have some, if everybody, if anybody's into research, we have some cool stuff that just came out just uh, at the beginning of the month. So go to uh, ownerreadiness.com. Actually, Sean and I were just hanging out in Minneapolis just a couple of weeks ago where we debuted this research to a mixed crowd of business owners and business advisors within the state. John, why I mentioned it, why it's unique is that it's the first time in our 10 years of doing state of owner readiness surveys that we had comparable data. So 2017, we did a survey in Minnesota, uh, looking at lower middle market and small business owners. And now in 2023, we did it again. And I start there in, in, in terms of identifying uh, potential targets for this, because I think there's there's two different stories. I think for the first time, uh, we're seeing like that, that wave that we talked about 10 years ago with this $10 trillion opportunity, average baby boomer, 67 years old, all the folks that are in the M&A world right now, I think we've been pretty busy over the last couple of years. So I think we're we're really starting to see those boomers saying, okay, you know, whether it's age and health, uncertain econo economic outlooks, favorable valuations, we're starting to see those boomers say, okay, at 67, I think it's time to maybe harvest at least some of the value of this asset and maybe invest in some other things or move to, a, to a, another phase or act of my life. To me, and, and maybe being a, in, in, the, in the younger generation X kind of crowd, uh, I think that's our most, you know, maybe our most interesting market. We see that now 43% of the small to lower middle market companies here in the United States are owned by people between 36 and 56 years old. And I mentioned that in terms of identifying because I just feel that if you looked at their generational characteristics, they're much more in tune to exit strategy. They kind of look for a, a work-life blend and balance. They believe in saving money and investing conservatively. They believe in working smarter, not whole, harder to their use of technology. And they're really, really open to feedback. 2017, when we asked those owners, yeah, what to what level have you concentrated on your exit strategy to date? One of the answers you can give is your top priority. Well, back in 2017, which wasn't that long ago, 6% of them said uh, it was my top priority. This year, 28% of them said it was their top priority. We just finished LA County, they're up to 35% saying it's in fact their top priority. But if you look at those age demographics, they're in that generation X age. So I think again, it's a lot more common for them. So if I'm in this market, I'm saying, I wanna identify people that I, I can bring into this kind of process uh, and have this buyer's perspective maybe already at least in tune a little bit. I think that generation X, and I think they have, again, as we said before, multiple opportunities to go and exit. But I'd like to echo Sean. I think the name of the game in, in really targeting uh, uh, these business these business owners for value acceleration and then transition is really through forms of education. I think people are coming to things like owner roundtables. They're listening to webinars like this. They're listening to podcasts and, and reading short eBooks. So I think that really that 
education is really the name of the game when it comes to owner engagement. And I could not agree with Sean Moore. We always say at the Exit Planning Institute, we need to stop giving owners the right answers and start asking the right questions and listen. And I don't care if you're the M&A advisor, the wealth manager, the CPA, I think having real conversations with business owners uh, is really the name of the game at this year and beyond as we, again, see these younger owners kind of come into the come into the market. Mm -hmm. But I think that, again, favorable uh, because I think they're naturally looking to tell their story. But listen, not just give them the right uh, give them the right answer. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm seeing that in my M and A practice, where this, uh, you know, we've been talking about this transition of baby boomers for the last 10, 15 years yeah. is actually materializing right now, right? Like they are yeah. of age, um, and I think I think COVID maybe has accelerated that, where people are thinking more about health, family, you know, leisure, uh, travel, and and I think I think you know these these conversations around exit, um, you know, are definitely. Um, accelerating yeah and i also also think sure. that work that that you guys are doing work you know that uh, divestopedia is doing on the education piece yeah. i think i think um that that uh, information is just more out there right P people recognize how important um yeah. yeah you know starting this process earlier is um so yeah, yeah more so more so than ever i was just on recording an episode of my podcast right before i came on this and this was a a, a topic just the access to education is so much greater than it was before, right? You Google exit planning or exit strategy and a bunch of stuff comes up. So I think that overall, if you look past the 10 years, over the last 10 years, exit planning is right at our fingertips. But I think that what a cool place to be in, because if you could take somebody that's 30 or 35 and just starting out maybe in their business owner or entrepreneurial journey and teach them something like the value acceleration methodology or the stuff that we're kind of talking about today early on, how much value they would create over a lifetime when they sell that business is 10, 15, or maybe 20 years, how maybe easier of a job it is for an M&A advisor and how much more collaborative it is, is, is along the way. And again, across all three legs, some of the statistics, uh, statistics that Sean, was, Sean and I were talking about, we don't have that 75% of owners that profoundly regret selling their business. They're happy to sell it because they're moving into the next act. And we don't have what you talked about, 70% of the businesses actually failing that go to market. We have 70% that are actually that are winning when they go to market and the new owners of that business, whether it's a private equity group, a, 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 a some, a, some type of other corporate type buyer, or even the family or employees, we're kind of all moving the needle forward. And think about the social and economic gains that we have in our country, if we could really make that happen. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, it's great work that you're doing at the EPI there, uh, Scott and, and uh, Sean as well with, with your involvement. So, so Sean, maybe, uh, and we've touched on this already. I mean, you've done a great job of kind of like talking about the communication, but could we further explore ways to effectively um, like communicate this value of early engagement uh, to potential clients? Like, well, what is it that you tell them, um, you know, the benefits could be? And then, you know, maybe, maybe expanding on that too. How do you bring other advisors into that process? Sure. Um, so. You know, first of all, um, most one one of the one of the interdisciplinary um, sort of concepts, if you will, or pillars within the SEPA community is that this is a holistic process. So it includes optimizing the value of the business, uh, doing your personal financial planning so that you have uh, a better sense of what your personal financial readiness is. And then also having a plan for life after business. We call that three legs of the stool. They all have to be balanced. They all need to be simultaneously worked on. Stool gets wobbly or falls over. So that's actually a concept that can be uh, pretty surprising to business owners because when you put it like that, they're, they're immediately intrigued uh, that, hey, this really does all kind of fit together, this personal and business track, right? So, but the importance of that, I think, for the early engagement with, with their owners to a certain extent is, look, the business represents a huge amount of your personal net worth. It's typically 75 to 95% of the personal net worth of any business, business owner. Much, just a crazy concentration in one security, right? If any, if you were talking to a financial advisor, if your financial advisor called you, John, and said, hey, I've got a really good idea. I want you to put 90% of your net worth in one stock. And by the way, it's private. It's going to be really hard to get out of what would you say? You'd say you're fired because you've obviously lost your mind. But that's what entrepreneurs do. And we do it readily. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been from a family business. I'm third generation family business in addition to the businesses that I have today. I readily accept 
the risk of having this giant amount of net worth in my business and the possibility that I won't be able to monetize it at some point in the future. So, so that's going to play into my personal financial planning. If I have a hole in my wealth that needs to be filled by the monetization of the business, harvesting the value out, I'm going to look to my business to do it because that's where most of it is. So, so for an owner, when you're talking to them, once you put those things together, the value in early engagement come, come from a lot of different places. First of all, they might just be able to go get a personal financial plan that they don't have and get a lot of clarity on what is it that I need to do in order to be successful in my life after business. I'm going to need money. How am I going to have enough to live this out? If I look to the business, then as the primary driver of that future wealth and the wealth that I need to protect and monetize, the value there for the value growth community is we can help you monetize it as it is today, potentially, but probably grow the value in the meantime and monetize it or harvest it later at that higher value point. When you talk to them about how long that's going to take, some people are like, I thought it would take a year. Well, it's not going to take a year. It's going to take three or four or five or seven or maybe even 10. Early engagement gives you options. Early engagement provides you with a better probability of success down the line. It's like it's like transition fitness, right? Who wants to run a hundred mile race having never been to the gym? It's an impossibility. You're going to get, you know, a mile into it and it's going to be miserable. So, so when you have that holistic conversation with them, when you kind of tie it all together, wherever they are, wherever their head is, they're going to find value in getting started with something. Early engagement allows us to have a conversation on the level of let's just do one thing. We don't need to do it all right now. Let's find a way to get this process started because it can be very overwhelming, very black box. So let's, let's do one thing. If that do one thing is get a personal financial plan, fine. Process is started. The early engagement is work. If it's Let's go find you a good estate wills trust attorney because there might be some issues there. Great. Process started. The, the early engagement has worked. Whatever that looks like, the momentum that's created out of these conversations will carry on for years. But having a conversation about something that doesn't matter, it doesn't engage them, will create headwinds that last for years. So it's really, it, it's that holistic point of view is an engine for change. Right, that C plus three legs of the stool is an engine for change. It becomes a context for decision making. That's what I always say. Exit planning is context for decision making. They're going to have to make some really big decisions, many many decisions along the way that are going to challenge uh, them, challenge their families, challenge their employees. There's going to be a lot, a lot to deal with. But their early engagements help uh, helps them mentally, physically, if you will, prepare. It also helps them get their business ready. Oh, we have a a tagline at, at my company, uh, Ready for Next, that's called that we say transition ready. The most valuable businesses are transition ready. So by virtue of the fact that they've worked on transition readiness, they've created enterprise value, or at least created more transferability in the enterprise value that they have. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, hey, Scott, someone asked about yep. that state of the readiness. Uh, yes. Um, what was that website again? So I had thrown it in the chat, but just want to make sure that we got the yeah, right one. Yeah, I think I saw you throw it in. That's the right one. Simple okay. one of you. It's it's ownerreadiness.com. It'll take you to the same spot, but you'll see the most recent survey there where it's at the state of Minnesota, and you'll see about a dozen other regional or statewide surveys that we've done over the last 10 years. And we actually have a, a national state of owner readiness survey going on right now, John. So you'll see that there. So if you have some business owner clients and you're looking to get to know them a little bit more, or at least how transition ready they are, have them take that that survey. Those results will be out in, in February of next year. Um, but nonetheless, that's a, that should be which should, that'll be another interesting conversation, John, because that'll be ten years since we've done the first one. We did the first one in 2013, and a lot of the stats that we all know, right? Owners were very ill prepared. Hopefully, at least they're more aware now, working on uh, working on getting prepared. But we're excited about it. But yeah, you have the right site inside the chat if you see John's. Book. Okay, perfect. Yep. Uh, one, one thing you chatted about uh, earlier was just around, um, you know, the education piece, like, and how you get it out. And and one thing that I really love about, um, you know, just just the opportunity that I've been afforded through Divestopedia and, and doing these webinars is really providing practical advice uh, to people in, uh, you know, in our community and in, in our network, people that are attending right now. Um, so, so, Scott, what would you say are some, like, techniques 
um, that you know your SEPA members or you in particular with uh, the EPI are using to just really communicate um, you know credibility, trust uh, to these business owners to, to really kind of send that message out. Yeah, this is an interesting question, I think, John, because the, where I want to go with this is when I think about building trust and establishing expertise, in particularly in this exit planning space, I think part of being the expert or being credible is knowing that you're not the expert in everything. As Sean was kind of talking about, too, is really when you think about the robust ecosystem that is the value acceleration methodology or exit planning, is that you certainly have your core group of people, right? Your, your core advisors, you have your CPA, your wealth manager, uh, your attorney, and, and likely some type of value growth advisor maybe even a, a banker sitting around that table. But when you change the mindset from income generation to value creation, that team starts growing and growing and growing. It would include people like cybersecurity, marketing, sales, human resources, leadership, life coaches, M&A professionals, family enterprise advisors. The ecosystem is robust. So if I'm an M&A advisor or really any advisor kind of leading this kind of conversation, kind of my first question is, and again, in, in, in the, your question around establishing kind of expertise and building trust and credibility is, my first question would be, well, what kind of team do you have? So when we start to get into that deeper conversation, I'd like to recommend my uh, a colleague of mine that does X, Y, or Z in that space. So you know enough to kind of understand the high level, but you also know enough to when to pivot the conversation to, I have a partner that will come in that that will address that, that, address that issue. The other thing I think is critical in, in our environment today is what, what process are you using? So is it turnkey? Is there deliverables? Is it, can you execute it? I think one of the things obviously in our, in, in the methodology that, that we have that my dad created 10, 10 or something years ago is that it made it a part of the business owner's life. I'm actually kind of pivoting the conversation to talk more about a value acceleration centric lifestyle versus a process and, and methodology. So I think that if I'm looking to, to build trust to gain credibility or showcase expertise, it's what process can I bring in to, to implement with the business owner that matches a little bit of what they do today that takes these daily things that they're doing and turns it into a value conversation. Because I think that we can all agree that owners are doing things in their business every single day that will eventually affect their exit, whether it's in terms of value uh, in their business or more personal value in the, in the kind of the vision, the purpose, the personal financial mm -hmm. plan. So I think people and I think process when I think about building expertise and, and and perhaps building credibility and trust. Yeah, you brought you brought up an interesting kind of concept around you know it being very collaborative and bringing in yes. lots of different uh, advisors. You know, I, I have found kind of in the real world where people, you know, it's my client. You know, I'm going to do yeah. everything uh, with them, right? And and not yeah. bring in other advisors. So just practically, how how does the SEPA community like really kind of try to bring in the best? advisor for that, you know, the stage of where the business owner is at. Totally agree. I think that uh, some of the best advisors, certainly the best SEPAs in our community have really one of maybe three things that they've mastered is really becoming a connector and a collaborator. So I think that's about getting involved, getting involved in these webinars, the think tanks, getting to some in-person events, getting back to the old fashioned, shake the hand and get to know each other. But I think it actually goes a little bit deeper. What you'll see in our community is uh, case study sessions, where instead, like me and Sean can go out for dinner and I can get to know Sean and say, you know what, I'm the attorney, he's the value growth advisor, I think that we could really do business together. It becomes a deeper relationship when me and Sean sit around a round table, roll up our sleeves and look at a case. So now I get to, now I get to know how Sean actually thinks about an owner's company. So not only am I getting a little bit more educated along the way uh, through the knowledge gain of, of this kind of collaborative share, but I'm also getting to know Sean on a deeper level. So now, not only do I I think I'd love to introduce Sean to a client. Now I know what's going to happen when he comes into a client. So what you'll find, at, at least in our community at EPI, SEPA or not, really in the chapter network, you'll see a lot of collaborative case study roundtable type sessions where, where we're expanding our knowledge that way, but really kind of getting to know each other on a more intimate level because we're starting to th see how we all think about doing business together or, or how we think about doing business with that business owner's uh, company, employees, personal financial situation, whatever that might be. I love I love that. Um, let me. There's a position I think in the interdisciplinary team that's really important that we haven't talked about, and that's the quarterback. So you're not this this being a complex process and one that potentially could last a long time. You're working with very very capable professionals. We have a policy at my company of we I don't refer business to non sepas I don't want to offend anyone, but because we share a methodology, because we share vocabulary. It just is a lot easier for us to complete the work in a very efficient way that 
results in client satisfaction, right? They appreciate the fact that we're not giving conflicting advice or all over the place. But, but if you've got, you know, six or eight professionals that are part of this interdisciplinary team in a complex process, there has to be somebody that's at the center of that web, so to speak, that's kind of, you know, coordinating process, coordinating communications, resolving conflict, making sure budgets are conformed to the whole, that whole piece, that whole center is really an important part. Otherwise it just starts up, things just start to kind of fly off the rails. So, so somebody has to be designated as the quarterback. It might be value growth advisor. It might be a wealth advisor. It might be an attorney. As long as they have the training and know what they're doing, know why they're doing it and how to do it, then anybody I think can be successful, but it's not an easy job. I mean, you can imagine, uh, you know, we all uh, capable professionals have very strong opinions sometimes, but if you go in humble, and I think that's really in a way, a key to becoming a trusted advisor to an owner is to practice humility. You know, we always say, we're never going to know as much about your business as you do right off the bat. We're not here to tell you how we're here to provide additional perspective from our experience, our expertise, but we're really force multipliers for you, right? We're going to probably do things that you haven't been able to get to. We're going to be able to add a layer of expertise to your business, but at its core, it's still about the owner and their team. We can't possibly catch up with someone who's been running it for 40 years and we shouldn't even try. So, so it's really about understanding how that, what the team dynamics are going to be, what the knowledge sets are and what role you play. That way the team can really stay together. I think throughout the process, there are hard decisions to make. Some people I've been in situations where, you know, the owner wants to use the accountant that they've been using for a long time. And that accountant is a great person and they've done a great job on the taxes, but they're not qualified to do this thing that we need to do. It's kind of like a generalist versus a specialist. Yeah, so, no, I, so, I love that collaborative approach that uh, your, yeah. your community kind of promotes. Uh, I, th I think it's more um, available to us now, like, you know, as an example, probably, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you know, a firm like, like Sean's that, that specialized on the value growth, um, you know, just wasn't around, right? Like, you know, yeah. we, we had a lot of general, a lot more generalists. And now we have these kind of boutique firms that have this um, very, um, very niche expertise, which, um, you know, kind of facilitates and allows a lot more collaboration, which is awesome. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about developing kind of a tailored approach for each client. Uh, so Sean, I'll stick with you on this, but, but could you just highlight the importance of understanding each client's unique needs and goals when you're entering into these, these early, early engagement conversations? Yeah. So, um, let me, let me try to narrow it down a little bit, I think just from our experience. So there, there are, we think, three things that an owner should expect to receive, if you will, out of a process that, like what we've been discussing, things that are going to matter to them. One is clarity. So, so clarity is worth a lot. Sometimes owners will just pay for the clarity, right? Having someone who can help them think through things. The second, the, the thing you have to figure out, though, fairly early in the process is whether they are interested in liquidity or legacy or a mix of both. This is, this is a crucial conversation. So if you go to an owner and you start talking about a liquidity event right off the bat, like with the assumption that that's really what they care about is liquidity, without having a conversation about does that matter a whole lot to you or are we really talking about your interest in maintaining the legacy that you've created over a period of time? And that doesn't necessarily just uh, apply to family businesses where there's a clear kind of multi-generational you know, possibility there, but it can also be about, you know, the identity of the business remaining in place and not disappearing. It can be about the legacy of management or the legacy of the employees or the legacy of the customers. When we've had that, I mean, it is possible that you would run across, let's take a family business as a, as a example. There are family businesses that transfer for no cash at all. It's an estate tax wealth protection asset growth strategy. So to the predecessor generation, they're essentially saying, I don't care about liquidity at all. None of it. I don't need it and I don't care about it. What I care about is the legacy. That changes the conversation uh, profoundly. If 
quite frankly. And so we now we begin to use words that matter the most to them because words matter in these situations. That's going to be one of the you know, sort of principles of our engagement with them is the language matters a lot. So I always caution my colleagues who may go in early with the assumption that we're going to talk about a liquidity event and that's always what matters, right? That they're probably missing an opportunity and potentially saying something offensive that would put the client, uh, you know, that would put the client off. So I, I just, uh, that's proven to be a really useful framework for us to say, let's talk about liquidity and legacy. Now they're not necessarily, you know, mutually exclusive. You can balance the two and it may change over time. There's a possibility that you may start working on a legacy with a client and halfway through they have a terrible time in the market or whatever it might be and liquidity becomes a whole lot more important. That can shift the conversation also. So one of the things that I would say about this process is the endpoint might sort of be clear and we have an idea that this is where we might want to end up in three or four or five years. But the process has to be built to be agile because things are going to change along the way and they could change rapidly and a lot. So, so we revisit these conversations from time to time throughout the process just to make sure that we're aware of any material developments, any material changes, how they feel about it, so on and so forth. You have to have these touch points to make sure that you don't need to necessarily re-engineer or rethink you know, where you are. The custom, the customization comes out of those, really those two fun, I think those two fundamental questions. Are we at the liquidity? Are we legacy or somewhere in between? And what does that yeah. mean? And, and I mean, the, the team that you put around it also uh, is dictated by, you know, Absolutely. the answers to those questions, right? Absolutely. Who has the expertise to execute? Yeah. You know, I'm often surprised, um, you know, when clients come to me, they have a very kind of black or white um, kind of a view of, of what the options are, right? I'm either staying or I'm going, um, but there are so many things in between. Um, you know, there could be an ESOP, there could be a management buyout, there could be, you know, private equity, there could be strategic buyer, there could be this, yeah. uh, you know, just trans inter intergenerational transition. Um, so, you know, it really is kind of amazing, um, you know, just, just how, you um, maybe limited uh, the view of, of kind of the succession is for, for a lot of business owners. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, maybe we could sure. just talk about, um, you know, sharing some best practices for customizing the approach uh, and services and, and maybe adding to that, you know, does the app actual SEPA designation provide like a little bit of a framework for how um, to engage clients earlier and to implement, you know, some of the things that we're talking about here? Uh, yeah, sure. So it's a, a three gated methodology. So if you are an M&A advisor on, on, on our, our webinar today, there's a, there's obviously a whole gate that you participate in, but I would challenge that you guys could be involved way earlier on in the equation. So we have the discover and the prepare gate of the methodology, which is really where we're rolling up our sleeves and kind of walking through this identify, protect and build value in cycles, right? Well, it could be a year, it could be two years or three years, but Without doubt, yes, EPI provides the, the methodology, the, the process, the mindset, the shifts that allow you to get involved earlier on. And through our partners, we provide the tools and the advisors that allow you to build your team and, and get more interactive, maybe a little bit more personalized and, and uh, uh, with the business owner, uh, with the business owner as well. Yeah, awesome. And, and um, you know, maybe we could just talk about like, I, I guess you touched on legacy already, Sean. Um, you know, what, what are, what are some other things that like, there's the, the liquidity and there's the legacy, but what are some other things that business owners like really find important, um, and really want to consider when they're, when they're, when they're thinking about what exit option is the best for them? We, um, when we do something called transition options analysis, which basically helps an owner kind of consider multiple options, some might already be off the table. Like if they're not a family business or they don't have anybody to transfer it to within their family, that one might be off the table. But we look at fit, which is really about values and culture, feasibility, which is about technical feasibility, likelihood, which is about the context of the case at a point in time. So as an example, you might have, uh, it might, a option might fit the culture and the values of the owners well, it might be technically feasible, but the owners have very different opinions about when it should happen. That makes it less likely, and then ultimately degree of difficulty within the con within that particular context. Not 
in the con not not as you know sort of general hey esops are harder to do than this well yeah that might be right but that might not be the case in this particular client situation so when we kind of map all that out it helps the owner kind of organize what actually is important to them right most of the time owners will first make in my experience will make a decision about which path to take based on fit based on their values so they will say i don't think i want to sell my business to a third party because that third party may close my factory and move the business somewhere else and that's going to affect my community i don't want that to i'm i've got to live in this community after i sell this business i'm not moving to an island in the middle of the caribbean so or maybe they are good for them Mm -hmm. but they're going to stay close to home in a lot of cases and they don't want their their the memory to be that they sold out for a lot of money that they sold for a lot of money and then the business went away they don't want their employees to be harmed in a lot of cases i get a lot of questions around hey if i sell my business to x am i going to be able to protect my employees and my answer is probably not i mean they now own the business they now op operate the business they'll do what they think is best can we have some, you know, key employee stay bonuses? Can we do things like that to try to, you know, create some stability? That's in everybody's best interest. But yeah. that's really deal structuring. That's about money. For them, it's almost always about what's what do I believe is right for me from a value standpoint? What matches up? What's right for the family? What's right for the communities? What's right for the stakeholders? And often I think they make a decision about what's right for the stakeholders before they say, uh, hey, I'm just going to, you know, do what I think is right for me. And, you know, everybody else can just take a second position. Yeah, you, you brought up uh, money, which is obviously important in, in these instances when when such a you know big piece of a person's net worth is tied up in their business. So, Scott, when, when does the conversation around valuation come into play? Um, and you know, it's, it's such an important piece, at least I find in setting the right expectations on what's reasonable, reasonably attainable, uh, if you're looking to sell or transition or do, do anything. So it's right. I would say that's right out of the gate. It's like the catalyst for everything value acceleration. And for us, it's not just a one-time conversation. It's an annual conversation. So we're always tying back to the valuation. We, we talk about in, in, at EPI, you could think about it as a staircase, right? We call it the five stages of value maturity. At the top of the staircase is probably the ultimate goal for any owner is to be able to manage the wealth that they've get they've gained from harvesting the value of their business, which is the step right below manage. But if you go all the way to the bottom on the floor before you even get up to the first stair, it's identify value. So that's where the valuation would come in. So now, so we're looking at obviously we're looking at the numbers, but we're also looking at attractiveness and readiness factors. Because again, what we're trying to do is. And maybe if they could take anything from my segment of our webinar is that exit strategy is business strategy. There's really nothing different is that we're doing things in our business every single day that eventually affect the value of our company. So what we're trying to do is do evaluation early and then often so that every quarter, every year with that we're, we're working towards building a, a, a more valuable company and frankly, a more successful one right now. I think that's what we don't get right. It's like, it's not just about long-term value. It's about actually making a better company now, better employees, higher profits, the whole thing. And so valuation is a part of our discover gate. And again, it's done uh, first before we even get into anything. And then uh, is done on it. We, we would recommend done on an annual basis. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's, um, you know, very, very proactive. But how, how many companies do you actually see get a valuation on an annual basis? Right, that's what I'm saying. I think that uh, the companies that are working with SEPAs do. I can tell you Sean's probably clients are doing it. And Sean's <laughs> okay. actually helps me yeah. and dad out at, at the Exit Planning Institute too. So we would sit down every December and start working on this kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So Sean, for your clients, is that a formal valuation or is that? Yeah, uh, that's about where I was to, I yeah. was about to go there. It's a okay. great question. So, so I think for a lot of owners, there is uh, they, they don't want to do evaluation sometimes because they've been told that evaluation is going to be expensive. It's going to cost me $25,000. Uh, not true. Um, a certified valuation probably will cost you that much, but a certified valuation in my opinion, is needed when you're going to plan your estate, is needed when you have uh, uh, something that's related to tax or the IRS or a legal dispute. Those kinds of things, that's where it's going to matter. That's where it stands up. 
But a calculation of business value is just fine in the beginning. And even before that, just some something that would give us kind of a clear shot, a clear uh, idea of where the company's value may stand relative to other companies in the marketplace. It could be just pulling comparables or something to give us kind of a, a point in time, right? Something that we can point to that says, hey, when we started the process, that's that's about where we are. The, the purpose, it's also, it's also confusing to an owner in most cases when they when when they understand that if you're doing an estate valuation for gifting purposes, let's say, you want the value to be low. You want to gift at a low value. So gifting early and having the value, the business valued early, it, that's for one purpose. When you're doing it for investment value, for instance, you have different motivations and different, different standard of value. You're going to have different values based on the way that you exit a business, right? A strategic valuation will be higher than an ESOP valuation, for instance. Interfamily transfer is generally going to come in at a much lower value than, than a private equity group is going to pay. So this idea that it's one company with many values, depending on the kind of valuation, for what purpose, according to what standard of value, it's a very complex area. So one thing that we have to do, I think, when we start talking valuation with owners, just sit down with them and say, all right, let's just kind of lay out the menu here and talk about it for a minute so that you understand what you're getting and what, what you're paying for and what the outcome, the expect, the, what, how you can use it, right, and not use it in the future. That's helpful. And then once they get that valuation in place, the subsequent valuations are important data points, I think. But the most important part of the conversation is, why did we move from X to Y? What drove the value in this 12 months that we've been working on it, right? What might have held it back? Maybe we could have gone even further, but what was the headwind for us uh, that might have held it back? So as we go through that process, our clients get a whole lot more engaged and much smarter and more focused on what's actually driving value in their business. And they begin to shed things. We call it feed, starve, feed the things that create value, starve the things that don't. They begin to starve stuff that just isn't adding value to the company. That could be eliminating products and services that just aren't doing much for them. It could be re-engineering how they relate to the marketplace. All sorts of things start to happen, but those value points are important kind of stakes ground in the ground along the way. This can be a uh, just a webinar in itself, just valuing yeah. uh, businesses, <laughs> and, and uh, which uh, yeah. you know I, I might have to jot down that uh, idea for one of our next <laughs> webinars, uh, and also for our audience. I mean, um, you know, kind of shows the benefits of uh, you know potentially getting a SEPA designation to. You know, if, if you're a business valuator, especially, there's lots of opportunities for referrals uh, within the network there. Yeah. Um, so, Scott, um, just quickly, uh, we're going to maybe take two minutes uh, here, a minute. Just talk about, like, overcoming some of the challenges that people have. Like, you know, there's so many statistics out there that show that business owners recognize the importance of all this, um, but if so few are actually doing it. So, you know, maybe give us some some really practical things that, that uh, you know, okay. our, our advisors here on the call can can use to overcome some of the uh, common uh, objectives or sorry, objections. Yeah, no, I think three things. You're absolutely right. In the state of owner readiness survey, the first question we ask is, uh, to what level do you agree that having a transition strategy in place is important to you personally and uh, the future of you personally and the future of your business? If you added up all the little agree categories, you find that 99 percent of owners nationally do agree that having transition strategy, exit strategy is important. But as you dive deeper into that survey, most of the time, they're really not doing anything about it. And it is, in fact, that they do know it's important, but it's not urgent. So they're not concentrating it, concentrating it on, on like right out of the gate. So just when you ask me that question, there's maybe three things that come to mind that I think are practical com maybe conversations to have. One I already talked to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Exit strategy is business strategy. There's nothing different. We do things in our, our, our business every single, every single day that will eventually affect the value. So let's change our mindset from an income generation mindset to a value creation mindset. I think another real, re, like a, a reality for our, our business owners is that 50% of our exits in our country today are involuntary due to what we call the five Ds, these uh, destroyers of companies, a, a death, a, a, a partner dispute, distress on the business, all of these types of things. And they're realities for us. So why not take contingency planning seriously and start planning, uh, planning with the end in mind now so that if we are hit by one of these things or like a pandemic that we saw over the last three years, 
we can pivot and and uh, we can pivot in, in in the right way. Maybe the last thing that I'd leave you guys with is that I think many business owners believe that they have a very successful company, and I think they do. But again, as you heard me talk at the top of the hour, do they have a significant one? One that's highly valuable, ready and tra uh, ready and attractive, that's transferable really in any market, and that's aligned to their business, personal, and financial goals. I'd rather not have an owner be surprised when they attempt to go to market. I'd rather have them be very ready, very intentional, and very deliberate. And so I think really what we spent time in our country today is making owners very successful, but we haven't necessarily made them very significant. So how do we go from that success to significance? For us at EPI, obviously, it's the value acceleration methodology and living that value, acceler value acceleration centric lifestyle. That's awesome. Hey, Scott, I want to leave you with the last word on just how people can uh, explore the SEPA. Uh, also, someone's asked if SEPA has a Canadian arm. You are international. So maybe just really yeah. quickly talk about kind of the membership and how people can get involved. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. So I would just go to that earnsepa.com website, website. It'll take you to the overall API website. So SEPA or not. If you want to go full blown credential, I think it's I think it would be wildly beneficial. But if you want to dip some toes, we have something called EPI Academy. We have the Exit Planning Summit. Uh, you go to ExitPlanningSummit.com. It's the largest exit planning centric event in our country today, in the United States today. Uh, for our international audience, we're technically in 18 different countries. We have our two biggest outside of the United States are Canada and Australia. So we are, again, international organization. We don't have a direct arm. I saw some earlier questions, John, in there that said, hey, do you have a chapter in Canada or chapters in Australia or, or any part really of the world? So you don't have that necessarily established yet inside of these various different countries. But you do have our, 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 our international arm headquarters, if you will, uh, here at Exit Planning Institute, which, again, a lot of virtual education, a lot of recordings you can download. So if you're looking to immerse yourself inside of this exit planning ecosystem or just with a little bit more knowledge, feel free to interact with downloading content, listening to webinars, joining chapter meetings uh, from really any seat uh, around the world. Yeah, awesome. Great community that you're building, uh, you. Scott, uh, Sean, uh, you know, awesome work that you're doing too within this community. So really appreciate both of your guys' time. Uh, we're a couple minutes over and I apologize that, uh, for that. Um, so thanks again for this uh, awesome discussion. Uh, there will be a recording of it, so we'll send it out to all of the people that have registered. Uh, again, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Sean. Uh, have, Thank you. Yeah, have a great day, guys. You too. See you guys. Take care. Thanks. Take care.